Great. Well, if I could have the first slide up, um, Dave, that'd be useful. Um, I was just sitting there thinking, we've been working through this uh, letter to the Romans um, since the beginning of September, and, and in some ways, the first couple of chapters I'd probably describe as being fairly relentless in terms of driving home the point that they're making. Um, then we get a, a real sort of high point towards the end of chapter three, where this amazing, um, these amazing things are, are revealed. And then chapter four gets quite complex, um, which is where we, we are today. We, we were looking at it last week and looking at it again this morning. Um, and then next week, just for one week before we then begin to turn our minds to Christmas, um, we'll see some, again, amazing things that are, 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 are more straightforward. So deep breath this morning. Um, we're, we're in this sort of final section of... Uh, I'm going to use three slides um, just in the first sort of five, ten minutes, and then I'm actually going to give you a question just to ponder on, maybe to chat with somebody nearby, um, in terms of what faith is, how you would explain to somebody else what faith actually is. Um, it's can, I don't know, you may find that very straightforward, but it's one of those words that it's, it's good for us to think through. How would I explain that to somebody? What does it actually mean um, to have faith? You might want to think of an example where you've um, exercised faith in some way in everyday life this week just to share with someone as well so we'll do, we'll do that and then we'll get in just to the last sort of section of, of Romans 4 um, at the end by way of again trying to introduce where we've been um, I know so, some are, have, have been away sort of here and there so last week I tried to sum up Romans um, in a different version of the three little pigs um, we described if you remember the chapter one being like the Gentiles over there, so Isaac's going to be our Gentiles, and he's in his house of straw. And in Romans 1, Paul has made it very clear that because of the way we are as Gentiles, we, we don't want God really, we suppress the truth about God, uh, we want to go about life our own way, that actually the judgment of God, and Paul's been very clear, it's one of those relentless things, the judgment of God is coming. Every one of us is answerable to him, we will face him, there's a day appointed, and when the judgment comes, the house of straw that the Gentiles are hiding in will be blown away. Now here, Jenny is our, is our Jews, really, and they are in the house of sticks. They, there's a sense of a little bit more confidence in the house of sticks, um, which is where the story is so good, just a little bit more solid as a building. Um, they have Abraham, they have Moses, they have King David, they have history, they have God choosing Abraham and growing a great nation from Abraham. They belong to that nation. The men in that house of sticks have been circumcised, they have the sign of the covenant, they have the law given by Moses, they, they have a whole way of life that as God wants them to live, many festivals and feasts and, and everything else. And there's a real confidence there that when the judgment comes and begins to blow, that, that the house of sticks will stand. And in Romans 2, Paul's been very clear that the house of sticks will not stand in the judgment. The big question in chapter 2 for Jenny and her fellow Jews is, you have the law, but have you kept the law? And of course the answer to that is no. Their faith is in, in the sticks around them, is in the wrong place. And when judgment comes, the house of sticks will fall. And then in chapter 3, our great highlight is Pierre, the great highlight of any Sunday morning is Pierre, who represents the house of bricks. And this is chapter 3. God has provided salvation. God has provided rescue. Or in the words of Psalm 32, it's just read, he's provided a hiding place from his own judgment. And the house of sticks, uh, sorry, the house of bricks is, is built around Jesus Christ. It's around God taking human flesh, coming into the world, bringing salvation. Chapter 3, uh, be, being the one who pays the price of redemption. He sets us free. That's the redemption price. Sets us free from sin and death and the judgment of God. He is the sacrifice of atonement that, 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 that shed his blood on the cross in the place of sinners, whether Jew or Gentile. And the wrath of God fell upon him, was, di was diverted, propitiated away from us. And so salvation is possible only in the house of of bricks in Christ alone. And the key, we said over the last two weeks, to that house, to enter into the safe house, is the key of faith. Faith is the way into the house. Now, what we said last week in terms of Romans 4, what Paul's doing here is he's saying, well, okay, let me illustrate this to you, and particularly 
for the Christians in Rome who are of a Jewish background, who need to understand, he said, let me t- tell you, let's, let's go to Abraham. Let's think about the, the founder of the faith, where it all began. What happened with Abraham? And there's the first slide. And this is really verses one to three of chapter four. Paul basically says that when you think about Abraham, God came into Abraham's life from nowhere. Abraham done nothing to attract God's favour. God just chose to come into Abraham's life and he made a, a, a slew really of promises to Abraham. From you, Abraham, from your physical body, I'm going to bring descendants and I'm going to grow you into a great nation. Your name will be great. I will bless you. You will be in relationship with me. And, the, and that, that blessing will actually begin to move out to the whole world through you somehow. Abraham's not given the details at this point. But this is the promise. You will be the heir, if you like, of of the world. You will inherit the earth through you or for you and your offspring. And Abraham, we're told in Genesis, Paul tells the Romans, reminds them that Abraham believed God. He believed God's promises. He, He had faith. And as a result of that faith, that trust in what God had said, God then credits righteousness to Abraham. Abraham, like every other person, whether Jew or Gentile, is is not righteous before God. We're all sinful and fall short of the glory of God. But in that moment when Abraham heard God's promise, believed it, put his faith in it, God credited righteousness onto his balance sheet. Unrighteousness gone, righteousness credited. And then as the book of Genesis unfolds, one by one, the promises that God makes to Abraham are fulfilled. So the point Paul's making is that Abraham was made righteous, credited righteousness by his faith, not by anything else. Think about those in the house of sticks that think there's something else that could make them righteous. We go to the next slide and we're very quick on this. I'm sorry, there's a lot of words. But this is what we saw last week and what we see in the middle of this chapter. Two points, let me just grab the headlines. Paul wants them to see that Abraham was declared righteous before he was circumcised. Because there's a lot of trust in circumcision. And even the uh, the, the Jewish Christians in Rome trying to suggest maybe the Gentile Christians should be circumcised. It was so important. So Paul's saying, no, Abraham was declared righteous before he was circumcised. Righteousness from God comes simply by our faith, not by circumcision. And then the second point there, point two, Abraham was declared righteous before the law was given. So God making a person right in his sight is independent of circumcision and the law. It's by faith alone. And in that first half of the chapters we looked last week, we also noticed, therefore, the implications that Abraham is is declared to be the father of us all. He's the father of all who were declared righteous by faith. And he's the father of the circumcised who have Abraham's faith. So he's the father of us all. So, and we said last week, I'm, I knew I, I was feeling the excitement of this more than you, I, I guess. But that's, that's massive. In terms of world history, the, the, the Jewish people rightly said Abraham's our father. But what Paul is saying here is because Abraham was justified before God, he was declared righteous before God on the basis of faith alone, he then is the father of all of us who are declared righteous in God's sight, credited with righteousness by our faith alone. We're walking in Abraham's footsteps, as are those Jews that that have faith. (coughs) So righteousness is credited by faith alone. That's the point that Paul's trying to underline. And if we go to the next slide, the final slide, verse 16 uh, of this chapter, just just glance down at verse 16. Paul sums all of this up. He says, therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. So headlines before you get to talk to your neighbour. The promise of God that he would become a great nation, a great name, he would inherit a land, that worldwide blessing would come to him, he would be the heir of the world, all of those promises are received or they come by faith 
And it's by grace, says verse 16. Never, not by works, not by circumcision, not by keeping the law, not by going to church, not by having Christian parents, not by doing a kind thing for your brother or sister, you know, not by forgiving somebody, not by being kind, not by serving others. It's by grace. It's all by God's generosity that just overflows to people. The promise comes by faith, by the grace of God, the generosity of God, and it's guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. He's our father. So if you're a Christian here this morning, you are part of that great nation, that great people that God promised to Abraham. You're part of that special relationship where God will will bless you and keep you and walk with you. You have inherited a land, a promised land, a future in the kingdom of heaven, in the, in, the, in the paradise of God. You are part of that worldwide blessing that was promised to Abraham because you are Abraham's offspring. You're rescued by your faith as he was and his God is your God. So that's most of what's going on in chapter four. The question is, and it's an important question for us this morning is, what is that faith? Because it's, it's the faith that connects us into the promise of God. We receive that promise by faith. So what is that faith? That's our question for the next few minutes this morning. So have a little chat with someone nearby. How would you describe what faith is? How, 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 yeah, what words would you use if somebody said, what is faith? What is Christian faith? Is there an example where you've used faith in this week that you could say, oh, it's like this, when this happened or when I did this or... Can you think of an example of faith? I'll just give you a minute, have a chat, wake up the sleepers, and then we'll come back. Okay, just, yeah, we'll draw those conversations to a close. Fantastic. Well, let's um, come back together. I think I'll just, we'll just leave those conversations and uh, illustrations and and sort of comments in in your minds as we take a look mainly at verses 17 now to the end of chapter 4 where the focus goes right in on on Abraham's faith. Um, What did it involve? What did it look like? Um, I just want to say three things, just three observations on Abraham's faith, and then we'll we'll sort of see how they translate uh, very closely to to us and what Christian faith looks like. So the first thing, if you look down at verse 17, uh, we're told there that um, he is our father, the middle of verse 17, in the sight of God, in in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being um, things that were not. He is our Father in the sight of God in whom he believed. Seems an obvious thing to say, but that's the starting point in terms of Abraham's faith. His faith was in God. Um, God is the object of his faith, and that's absolutely crucial. 
Um, we said last week, or a couple of weeks ago, I think now on Remembrance Sunday, the example of the chairs that we're sitting on, they're just quite a useful one. I don't know what examples you came up with perhaps from during the week, but um, we've all put our faith in our chairs as we sat this morning. Um, but we made the point two weeks ago that it's not our faith that's keeping us off the ground. It is actually the chair. Um, both are important. If you didn't have faith, you wouldn't be sat down. But it's the chair that's keeping us up. It's the object of our faith that is important. Um, over the years, I've always checked the football results uh, during the week or on the weekend. There's a couple of teams I particularly look out for. But since being here, I begin to look out for more teams because I know which teams are important to different people. So I will always check how Luton have got on. I've got to see, um, do coffee cake and chat with Richard Capaldi. I want to know what mood he's going to be in when he arrives. <laughs> How did Luton do? How, how have Sheffield Wednesday got on before an elders meeting, just to know whether, where Dave's going to be you know, in our meeting? Uh, in the last couple of years, I've actually begun to pay a little bit of attention to Plymouth Argyle, the mighty Plymouth, um, Pete Googe's team. And uh, this year, listen, Matt Pete's, who's, Pete's, Pete's a passionate fan. He's got on his faith, on his chest, in Plymouth I trust. It's, it's a tattoo Pete's got. He's very serious. <laughs> His faith is in the green, the green army. And the thing is, as you watch this year, I mean, they've been, I think, top of the league for quite a while. It's been a, a good time. And you can th feel, can't you, you know, my faith is well placed. I put it in the right place. Look at them go. And the cracks, I think, be, uh, are beginning just to appear uh, over the recent weeks. A few losses sliding down the table a little bit. Um, so that, you know, it's sort of, oh, if I put my faith in the right place. The object of our faith is critical. It's, it's, it's what we put our faith in, it's what we're believing that really matters. Abraham's faith, notice in verse 17, is in God, the God who Paul describes here, who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Verse 17, he is our father in the sight of God, in, in whom he believed, in whom he put his faith, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. There's a sense, an echo of creation almost there. God calling into being things that were not. Speaking, let there be light, let there be this, let there be that. Speaking things that were not there into being. That's the God in whom Abraham placed his faith. The God who gives life to the dead. The second aspect of Abraham's faith is actually that there's an acknowledgement of his helplessness. Verses 18 and 19, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations just as it had been said of him so shall your offspring be without weakening in his faith he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and Sarah's womb was also dead back in that story what all this is taken from in Genesis Abraham is a hundred years old Sarah is not much younger her womb is closed she's barren She's beyond the age of, of bearing children. God has come into their lives and promised them a child and that from their bodies he was going to grow a nation of people more numerous than the sand on the seashore, more numerous than the stars in the sky. What is faith? Firstly, Abraham believed God. Abraham had faith in God. Abraham had faith in the God who gives life to the dead. See the significance of that in verse 17. Their bodies are as good as dead. How can they possibly have a child? But Abraham believed God. He acknowledged his own helplessness. He was aware of the, the death, as it were, in their own bodies and their inability to deliver God's promise for him. But thirdly, they trusted that God would keep his promise. Their faith was in God. His faith was in God, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being Isaac the things that were not. He acknowledged his helplessness and he trusted that God would keep his promises. Despite the outward appearance of hopelessness, he trusted that God could do and would do what he said he would do. Verse 20, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Of course, Abraham, like any human being and any Christian, has his anxious moments, had his ups and downs. 
but never stop believing that God would be faithful to his promise, that God had the power to deliver. Now, I think we can map what we see of Abraham's faith straight onto what Christian faith is. And I say that really because of verse 23 that says that the words it was credited to him, Abraham, were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. We are so connected to Abraham. Abraham had righteousness credited or imputed to him because of his faith, and that's exactly how God deals with us today. So we are sons and daughters of Abraham, and when we see his faith, we can learn things for our faith because of that connection. So how do we describe Christian faith on the back of what we see in Abraham? The same things. Firstly, our faith is in God. Our faith is not in an idea or a a philosophy or some sort of object. Our faith is in a person, a living being. Our faith is in God. Our faith is not, Christian faith is not airy-fairy. Sometimes you get this sort of horrible thing, don't you, of, well, I know it looks unlikely, um, we could, you know, God, I can't see. Um, sending his son into the world 2,000 years ago that I can't see and I can't be sure, but I just hope for the best. That's my faith. It's a shot in the dark. That's not Christian faith at all. It's in a person. It's in a person who gives life to the dead. It's in a person who brings things into being that are not. Christian faith is not Pierre coming in this morning and seeing that the illuminator have been up to no good and they've made a, a pretend chair out of paper so that when he comes in with his bass guitar, feeling that he's at Wembley Stadium and onto the stage this morning, he looks at this paper, paper chair. Christian faith is not Pierre looking at thinking, oh, blow, oh dear. <laughs> and then going into some sort of prayer-like, you know, a trance or state of trying to get the faith, the belief that this chair is going to hold me. Mustering the faith. And we know full well that when he sits on the chair, the illuminate will be rejoicing up there on the balcony as, as the bass guitarist is lying on his back on the floor. Faith is not trying to muster belief in the unbelievable. Faith is in a person. It's in in a reality. It's in a God who gives life to the dead. It's in a person who brings into being things that were not. And again, the parallels are all here. Chapter one, we Gentiles in our house of straw are facing judgment. We're facing death. The Bible says as people, having rejected God, we are spiritually dead now without him. And we are under the judgment that's coming. We are are under the eternal death. But we put our faith in the the God who gives life to the dead, who calls into being the things that were not. We are unrighteous. God calls us righteous. He calls righteousness into being in us, even though we're not. That's the God that we put our faith in. We acknowledge our uh, helplessness. That's Christian faith. I'm a sinner under judgment. I deserve that judgment. I have nothing to offer in my defence. That's part of Christian faith. That's my helplessness. That's my hopelessness. There is no hope of rescue inside myself. There is nothing I can do. That's Christian faith. Abraham saw that he and Sarah could do nothing. And thirdly, Christian faith trusts that God will keep his promise. That's the nub of Christian faith. God has made promises. Do you believe them? Christian faith trusts that God will keep his promise. If you're a Christian here this morning, as part of that that faith that you've put in God, you've said to him, I believe you have the power to fulfill your promises. You have the power to bring the dead to life. You have the power to give Isaac to Abraham and Sarah. You have the power to bring Jairus' 12-year-old daughter back from the dead. You have the power to say to Lazarus in the tomb for four days, come out. And most significantly in our faith, We believe he has the power to bring back from the dead the one who paid the redemption price for us. Having offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins and having been placed in that tomb, we believe God had the power to raise him as the conqueror of sin and the conqueror of the grave. Verse 25, we believe this in our faith. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. 
The amazing thing is Abraham and Sarah, in a sense, had so little to go on. This happened in Genesis 12 and 15. God had come into his life, their lives from nowhere, making these promises. Abraham, I guess, had the, the example of a world around him that had clearly been created by God. So little to go on, and yet he put his faith that God is, uh, is dependable, is trustworthy, will keep his promises. I believe God will do this. We, and if you're thinking about Christianity uh, this morning and, and, and considering where you will put your faith, we live in a time where we look back and we see that God kept his promise to Abraham. We see the birth of Isaac, then the birth of Jacob, then the birth of 12 sons to Jacob, and then the, the development of 12 sons into 12 tribes, and then a million people by the end of Genesis come from Abraham and Sarah entering into Egypt, and then the coming of Moses, the great redemption and rescue. We see all of this. We read the accounts of Jesus, God in a body who, who has the power to raise the dead. We can look at that evidence. We see the empty tomb. Christ raised, people beginning to trust him from a band, a motley crew of believers suddenly growing into a church that spreads the globe, place after place, people putting their trust in Jesus Christ, the house of bricks full to bursting. We have so much evidence to consider. We trust that God will, will, build, uh, will keep his promises, that he has the power to raise the dead. And likewise, we trust in God's power to raise all the sons and daughters of Abraham, all those who are in Christ, to everlasting life as heirs of the world alongside Abraham. That's Christian faith. It's all about the object. It's all about the promise maker and the one with the power to fulfil those promises. Christian faith is putting our confidence in the fact that God is faithful and he has the power to keep his promises. Christian faith isn't, doesn't claim to be perfect and unfaltering. In fact, the hallmark of our Christian faith is, is that our faith won't be perfect and it won't be unfaltering. But thanks be to God that we're saved by his generosity, his grace that carries sinners home. Let me just read the words at the end of the chapter to finish with before we hand back to Annika. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. And then Paul can't hold himself back. Just glance your eyes down at chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And he just keeps going in chapter 5. It's a great chapter of celebration. But we'll get to that next week.